Hello friends. In today's session, we are going to see some new topic related to utility classes. New utility classes, those are not part of collection framework. Okay. In, yesterday, uh, in previous session, what we saw, observe, observer and observing class and how they are related, interrelated using this add observer method. Okay. So, one is uh, having the counter, counting downside and second is observing that class which is counting downside and whatever the updated value of that count that will be printed on the console. Okay. So, we will see some explanation regarding this more than one object can be observed okay more than one class can observe a uh, single class the following program will implement two observing classes and adds an object of each class to being first observer list okay so in the previous session uh, that the example was having only one observer and here in this session in this video we will see one example that is having being watched to be observed by more than one object second observer waits until the count reaches zero and then rings the bell first of all import the java util package watcher one implements observer class then update observable object object argument update call count is updated value that is argument what is the argument second one dot integer value okay if it is passed then it is uh, have it is uh, being casted to an integer format uh, if it is null it cannot be casted okay then class class watcher 2 implements observer okay it is also updating the observ uh, observable class value with argument <coughs> then done slash 7 and the main class that is being observed that is being watch class extends observable interface void counter the same uh, same method that was that we saw in the previous session uh, same method is implemented here whatever value you will pass here to the counter that will be started with counting and up to the zero and downside one uh, one by one it is going, going to be decremented and set change set change method this method is very important if you will not call this method none, nothing will happen as the updated value and then next is notify observers new integer period whenever your period value is decremented by one set change will be called and then notify observer with the new value of period and after this period is updated over here this update value will be called and this argument will be your latest period value and that will be displayed on the console okay then one tenth of the millisecond that is 100 millisecond this will be slipping and then next is uh interpret exception if thread is interrupted in between okay so now two observers with main method the main method is being watched observed is equal to new being watched okay so observed class object is being created observing one observing two new watcher one watcher two classes those are observing this class being watched is created and add both observer to this observed object observe dot add observer observing one observe dot add observer observing two and counter starts from 10 you can uh, add any value as per your convenience you can add here 100 counting will be starting from 100 if you are adding here 50 counting will be started with 50 okay the observable class and the observer interface allow you to implement sophisticated program architectures based on the document view methodology okay so in simple or in short observable class and observer interface combinedly create a convenient method to one class observing another so that both will have synchronization both will have uh, interrelation correlation between the classes they are also useful in multi-threaded situations okay
नेक्स्ट टाइमर एंड टाइमर टास्क An interesting and useful feature offered by Java or Tutil is the ability to schedule a task for execution at future some time, future time. Scheduling a task for future. Interesting and useful feature by Java dot in package. So whatever task you are going to do, you are not going to do it at now at current time. You are doing it in future and you are scheduling at a particular time. The classes that support this are timer and timer task. Using these classes, you can create a thread that runs in the background waiting for a specific time. Okay. So what is the use of this? You can create a thread that runs in a background waiting for a specific time and when that time occurs, okay, at that particular time, this task will be performed automatically. When the time arrives, the task is linked to that thread executed automatically. Various options allow you to schedule a task for repeated execution and schedule a task to run on a specific day. Okay. So one task can be done many times and one task can be uh, executed at a specific date. It was always possible to manually create a task that would be executed at specific time using the thread class timer and timer task greatly simplify this process. Threading was also available but time and timer and timer task adds convenient to it. Uh, because both work together. Timer is a class that you will use to schedule a task for execution. Task is being scheduled must be an instance of timer task. Okay. Timer will do what? You will schedule a task for the particular, uh, for at the particular time for execution. If suppose you are going to uh, uh, perform a task on this, this date, you will specify that date and timer task will do what? The task being scheduled will be instance of timer task. Okay. So that task will be performed at a particular time. So that must be instance of timer task. And both combinedly will ge generate a situation at that particular time your uh, task will happen. Like an alarm in your mobile. Okay. You are uh, placing an alarm in the morning, suppose 6 a.m. So 6 a.m. not a is not a current time. You are sleeping if suppose at 10 p.m. night. Okay. And you are going to awake at 6 a.m. And you want to go to your office or job or business at whatever place that you want to. But what is the main uh, thing is this 6 a.m. time is not a current time when you are placing an alarm. Okay, you are telling your mobile that whenever that 6 a.m. time will be matching your current time, the alarm will bail. Okay, so same way timer and timer task both combinedly will work together to perform a specific task at a specific time. You will first create a timer task object that then schedule it for execution using instance of time. Okay, so both instances, both objects are important over here. Timer task implements the runnable interface thus which can be used to create a thread of execution. Okay, the constructor is timer task. So likewise your thread, it is implementing runnable interface. So it can be used to create a thread for execution. And the methods defined by timer task we will see now. Run method is abstract, which means that it must be overridden. Okay. Abstract means it must be implemented. Defined by runnable interface. Since you are implementing the runnable, run is compulsory. Contains the code that will be executed. Whatever you will write in the run method that will be executed. The easiest way to create a timer task is extend a timer task and override run method. So two things you have to done. Whatever class that you are going to generate, that will be subclass of timer task. And uh, second way, it is implementing the runnable interface so that it will have to 
override the run method. Okay, once the task has been created, it is scheduled for execution by an object of type time. The constructors for timers, now we will see, first is default constructor timer, okay, second is timer boolean d thread timer string name, timer string name boolean d thread, okay, so there are four types of constructors here, first is default constructor, second is boolean d thread, third is timer string thread name and fourth is string name thread name plus d thread. Okay, the first version creates a timer that runs as a normal thread, the second uses a daemon thread of d thread is true. The daemon thread will execute uh, only as long as the rest of the program continues to execute. So d thread is nothing but daemon thread. The first version creates only a normal thread and the second uses a daemon thread. If the thread is particularly true and the daemon thread will executed will be executed only as long as the rest of the program continues to execute. Okay. When uh, unless and until the rest of the program is being executed, daemon thread will exist or execute. Third and fourth constructor with string T name, that is thread name, allows you to specify a particular name for a timer thread. The methods defined by timer, now we will see them one by one. Okay. Boolean cancel terminates the task. Returns true if an execution of task is prevented, otherwise return false. Abstract void run contains the code for the timer task. Long scheduled execution time. Returns the time at which the last execution of task was scheduled to have occurred. Okay. First is cancel, will cancel the task. If it is cancelled successfully, it will return true, otherwise return false. Second is run, compulsory, contains the code for the timer task, what is to be done. Scheduled execution time is long, returns the time at which the last execution of task was scheduled to have occurred. Okay, it is the execution time. So, you that, so that you will understand at, at which time in long. So, you will convert that long into particular date and time using the date classes or calendar object we have seen in previous session. You will first of all get long milliseconds and that long milliseconds you will convert to date object or calendar object so that you will understand at which date at which time this task is to be performed. And void cancel cancels the timer thread. Integer purge Deletes the cancelled task from the timer queue. So, whatever cancelled tasks are there will be deleted. Void schedule timer task key task long wait. Timer task is scheduled for execution after the period passed in wait has elapsed. Okay. So, whatever timer task T task is done, uh, given here, is uh, scheduled for execution after the period is passed like uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, after uh, 30 seconds or 1 minute or 10 minutes and so on. Whatever wait time you will give in long, millisecond, that particular time is elapsed, this particular timer task is scheduled, okay? Then what is scheduled timer task, T task, long wait, long repeat, okay? If you are giving the repetition, you will give the repeat after how many seconds? T task is scheduled for execution. After the period passed in wait has elapsed, the task is then executed repeatedly at the interval between intervals specified by repeat. Both wait and repeat are specified in milliseconds. Okay. So, this particular task, T task, is executed or scheduled or after this particular wait time in milliseconds after current time and after each, uh, after this wait, first task is done. After this repeat milliseconds, this task is repeated. After again this much milliseconds, this task is again repeated. Void schedule, timer task, t task, date target time, 
टी टास्क इज शेड्यूल फॉर एक्सिक्यूशन एट द टाइम स्पेसिफाइड बाय टार्गेट टाइम वॉइड शेड्यूल टाइमर टास्क टी टास्क डेट टार्गेट टाइम लॉन्ग रिपीट टी टास्क इज शेड्यूल फॉर एक्सिक्यूशन एट द टाइम स्पेसिफाइड बाय टार्गेट टाइम द टास्क इज देन एक्सिक्यूटेड रिपीटेडली एट द इंटरवल पास्ट इन रिपीट द रिपीट पैरामीटर स्पेसिफाइड इन मिली सेकेंड ओके वॉइड शेड्यूल शेड्यूल एट फिक्स रेट टाइमर टास्क टी टास्क लॉन्ग वेट लॉन्ग रिपीट T task is scheduled for execution after the period past in wait has elapsed. The task is then executed repeatedly at the interval specified by repeat, as we have seen in the previous function. Both wait and repeat specified in milliseconds. The timer, sorry, the time of each repetition is relative to the first execution, not the preceding execution. Okay, after first execution, suppose. 1000 after 1000 milliseconds second task uh, second repetition will occur after again 1000 milliseconds third milli uh, third task execution will occur thus the overall rate of execution is fixed okay schedule at fixed rate so interval between each and every time interval between each and every task execution is scheduled at fixed time Like your alarm. Same example again. I am repeating over here. Why alarm? When you are snoozing the alarm, you have setting in your alarm setting. Okay, clock setting. If your uh, repetition time or snoozing time is ten 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 minutes, then after ten minutes your alarm will repeat again. If your uh, repetition time or snoozing time is five minutes, your alarm will bell five minutes between five minutes interval. Okay, so same way that fixed rate that you have provided here it is in long, but in your mobile it is in minutes. Okay, so this way that schedule task is done at fixed rate. Void schedule at fixed rate. Timer task T task get target time long repeat. T task is scheduled for execution at the time specified by target time. The task is then executed repeatedly. At the interval passed in repeat, then the repeat parameter specified in milliseconds. The time of each repetition is relative to the first execution, not the preceding execution. The overall rate of execution is fixed. Okay. So here date is added, and target time is also added. Sorry, date object target time is added over here. Whatever the task is ex executed repeatedly at the interval passed in repeat, so only target time is added in this method execution. Okay, so wait is not given. Other uh, uh, instead of wait, it is given a target time as a date object. Okay, so you don't have to wait. If suppose uh, this way schedule at fixed rate, you can give the date object. Uh, uh, if suppose after ten days, after today. If suppose uh, today's date is fourth of May, two thousand twenty-three. So on fourteenth of May, after ten days, on the same time, I want to do a task, perform a task. So I will give the date object. I will create a date object, and I will pass that date object to this function schedule at fixed rate. So here in this case, I will not give the wait time in milliseconds. Okay. So there is a difference between the previous one and This one. The time for each repetition is related to the first task, not the preceding task. Then, thus, the overall execution is fixed. Okay. Once a timer has been created, you will schedule a task by calling schedule on the timer that you have created. Okay. So now we will see the table. There are several forms of schedule method which allow you to schedule a task in variety of ways. So scheduling task is done by schedule method. If you create a non-daemon task, then you will want to call a cancel to end the task when your program ends. Okay. If you don't do this, then your program may hang for a period of time. So non-daemon task that is the task that will be executed till this uh, program is being executed. You would want to uh, call the cancel method <coughs> because daemon task will be executed until the program is finishing. 
but non daemon task will not be executed the, those threads will not will be executed throughout so for for stopping those threads you have to call the cancel method so that that particular task will be finished or cancelled if you don't uh, do this your program may hang because in background that thread will be running and running and running because that is the non daemon task okay so there are two types of task one is daemon task and second is non daemon task daemon task is which uh, it will perform its execution unless and until your program is being executed after your program is terminating your daemon task will also be terminating but non daemon task non daemon threads will be executed even after is your program is being finished okay so for non daemon task you have to call the cancel method on that task if you will not cancel those threads or those uh, those tasks will be run in the background and then your program will be hang or give, go into infinite loop or it may crash for a period of time okay the following program will uh, tell us about the timer and timer task it defines a timer task whose run method displays the message timer task executed this task is scheduled to run once every half second after a initial delay of 1 second okay so defines the timer task whose run method displays the message timer task executed so what is the function of run method over here only to display timer task executed nothing else this task is scheduled to run every half a second after an initial delay of 1 second <laughs> so i'm sorry so what is the motto of this program extends the run implements the runnable interface then uh, implement the run method what is the run method is doing timer task is executed okay so what is the task of this timer task timer task executed message printing okay and when it is be uh, it is be running after every half second after an initial delay of 1 second so if suppose uh, currently i am running the program or executing my program after 1 second after this this current time the message will be displayed again after half of seconds this message will be again displayed okay so first of all timer task extends timer task run timer task executed okay so what i am doing next is in main method my timer task my task is equal to new my timer task so object of my timer task which is extending the timer task is created over here and timer object is also created over here and initial delay my timer dot schedule schedule method is very important my task which task i have to perform my task okay so my task is now the subclass of the timer task because it is the object of my timer so it will be run like my task 1500 first of all it will be executed after 1 second and after delay of half of second the same message will be displayed and thread dot seek for 5000 milliseconds and catch interrupted exception so and since this is a non daemon task it will be cancelled by manually by us okay so you can see the output as um timer task executed repeated again and again okay so next class is currency class currency class encapsulates information about currency it defines no constructor the method supported by currency are shown in shown in table the following program will demonstrate the currency class okay encapsulate the information about a currency so currency can be anything it can be gbp it can be euro it can be dollar it can be inr etc etc okay currency c c is equal to currency dot get instance local dot us symbol c dot get symbol default fractional digit c dot get default fractional digits output is symbol dollar default fractional digits is 2 okay the methods defined by currency 
string get currency code returns the code as defined by so here the previous example is dollar us currency dot get instance of uh, local dot us is c and its symbol is dollar so it is displayed here and default fractional digits are two okay so now we will see the defined uh, methods defined by currency class string get currency code returns the code as defined by iso 4217 that describes the invoking currency get default fractional digits returns the number of digits after the decimal point that are normally used by invoking currency okay so currency code return the code of currency then default fractional digits as we have seen in previous session number of digits after the fractional symbol for example there are two fractional digits after the point or fraction static currency get instance local local object returns the currency <coughs> for the local specified by local object then currency get instance returns the currency object associated with the currency code then get symbol returns the currency symbol such as dollar for the invoking object get symbol for the local get returns the currency symbol such as dollar for the local past in local object okay then string to string returns the currency code for the invoking object next is formatter class with the release of jdk 5 that is java 5 java added a capability long desired by programmers the ability to easily create formatted output okay so formatter will create a formatted output in short since the beginning java has offered a rich and varied api but it had not always offered an easy way to create formatted text output especially for numeric values okay classes such as number format date format and message format provided by earlier versions of java to have useful formatting capabilities but they were not especially convenient to use <clears throat> beginning up to java 5 java had offers rich and varied api but not always offered an easy way to create formatted text output for numeric value like number format date format and message format provided by earlier versions of java do have useful formatting capabilities and but though were those are inconvenient to use unlike c and c++ that support the widely understood and used printf family of function which offers a simple way to format java had previously not offered such method so what is they are telling us about in short from java 1.0 to java 5 java offered a rich and varied api but not a formatted text output for numeric values number format date format and message format still provided uh useful formatting capabilities but they were not not convenient and also like cc++ they were uh, in cc++ they were offering printf function to give the formatted output but java had previously not offered such method one reason for this is printf style formatting requires the use of variable uh, length arguments which java did not support until the release of java 5 so for that purpose formatting was not available okay once var arc once var arcs were available it was a simple matter to add a general purpose formatter okay at the core of java support for creating formatted output is the formatter class it provides format convergence that let you display numbers strings and time date in virtually any format you like okay it operates in a manner similar to the c c++ printf function which means that if you are familiar with c c++ then learning to use formatter will be very easy and what formatter is given you giving you format convergence that let you display numbers strings time date in any format that you like 
and like it it is uh, it is working like a printf function in c c plus plus then learning to use formatted will be very easy if you are al already learn about the c c plus plus programming language and a printf function it uh, it also further streamlines the conversion of c c plus plus code to java formatted class if you are not familiar with the c c plus plus it is still quite easy to format the data okay so now we will see formatter constructors before you can use formatter to format output you must create a formatter object first thing okay in general formatter works by, con by by converting the binary form of data used by program into formatted text it stores the formatted text in a buffer the contents of which can be obtained by your program whenever they are needed okay how it is working converting binary form of data into formatted text and that store that formatted text will be stored in buffer the contents of which can be obtained by your program whenever they are needed it is possible to let formatter supply this buffer automatically or you can specify the buffer explicitly when a formatter object is created okay it is also possible to have formatter output its buffer to file The formatter class defines many constructors which enable you to construct a formatter in a variety of ways. Formatter construct sampling. Now formatter constructor samples are here. First is formatter default constructor formatter appendable buffer formatter appendable buffer local local formatter string file name stores file not found exception. formatter string file name string character set stores file not found exception unsupported encoding exception formatter file output f stores file not found exception formatter output string output string here buffer specifies the buffer for the formatted output if buffer is null the formatter automatically allocates a string builder to hold the formatted output the local parameter specifies the local If no local is specified, the default local is used. The file name parameter specifies the name of the file that will receive the formatted output. The character set parameter specifies the character set. Okay, so local is explained here. File name parameter and character set parameters are explained over here. If no character set is given, default character set is used. The output f parameter specifies the reference to our open file that will be receiving your output. that is formatted output the output stream parameter specifies a reference to an output stream that will receive the output when using a file output is also written to the file perhaps the most widely used constructor is the first which has no parameters which is very common which is which is very general it automatically uses the default local and allocates string builder to hold the formatted output okay the formatter method now we will see the method is defined by formatter r formatting basic formatting basic after you have created a formatter you can use it to create formatted string to do so use the format method the most commonly used version is shown here okay so we will see first of all table after you have created a formatter object you can use it to create formatted string use the format method the most commonly used version is shown here formatter format object variable type of argument now we will see the methods void close closes the invoking formatter this causes any resources used by the object to be released like file handle or anything after formatter has been closed it can be it cannot be reused an attempt to use the close formatter result formatter close exception okay once it is closed you cannot reuse it void flush flushes the format buffer so that it will be clear this causes any output currently in the buffer to be returned to the destination this applies mostly to formatted tied to file okay when you are flushing whatever file if suppose you are writing to particular file x y z when you are flushing a buffer whatever is there in that buffer that will be copied to that particular file and this flushing uh, normally applies to 
formatter tied to a file. Then formatter format string format string object argument format the argument passed via argument according to the format specifier contained in format string. Okay, so whatever variable uh, length arguments we are passing, it will format the argument according to the format specifier contained in format string returns the invoking object. Formats the arguments passed via arguments according to the format specifiers contained in format string. The local specified by local is used for this format returns the invoking object. IO exception. If the underlined object that is the destination for output shows an IO exception, then this exception is written. Okay. Otherwise, null is Local returns the invoking objects local. Appendable out returns the reference to the underlying object that is the destination for output. Okay. The format string consists of two types of items. The first type is composed of characters that are simply copied the output buffer. Okay. So, appendable returns the reference to the underlying object that is the destination for output. The first type is composed of characters that are simply copied to the output buffer. Format string, first type, have characters. Those will be copied as it is. The second type contains format specifier that define the way the subsequent arguments are displayed. Format specifier begins with a percent sign followed by the format conversion specifier. Okay, like in the C programming language, we were using like percent %d for integer, percent %f for float, percent %c for characters, percent %d for double and so on. Okay. So all format conversion specifiers consist of a single character. The format specifier for floating point is for percent %f. There must be the same number of arguments as there are for format specifier and the format specifiers and the arguments are matched in order from left to right. Formatter format is equal to new formatter, formatter dot format. Formatting is easy with Java 1098.6. So first format string is related to this string. So this percentage will be uh, replaced with Java, with Java. Then percent D is replaced with 10 and percent F is replaced with 98.6. So, output is formatting with Java is 1098.6. Okay. The format specifies percent as percent %d and percent %f are replaced with arguments that follow the format string. Percent is replaced with Java, percent is replaced by 10, percent is replaced by 98.6. All other characters are simply used as is. Okay. The format specifier. The format specifier percent s specifies string, percent d specifies integer, and the percent f specifies the floating point value. Okay. So now we will see the list. Percent A floating point hexadecimal percent A percent B small and capital for boolean percent C character percent D for integer decimal percent H capital small for hash code of the argument percent E capital small for scientific notation percent F for decimal floating point percent G capital small uses uh, percent E or percent F whichever is shorter percent O octal integer percent n inserts a new line character percent s string percent e capital small for time and date percent x integer hex and percent percent integer insert a percent sign into the formatted output okay the format method accepts a wide variety of format specifiers now we have already seen in table 18 12 okay 
Notice that many specifiers have both upper and lower case format. When an upper case specifier is used, letters are shown in upper case, otherwise those are shown in lower case. Upper and lower case specifiers perform the same conversion. Okay. When upper case specifier is used like percent S in capital, like this, the output is displayed in capital. And if you are giving the percent in, in small, they perform the same conversion. Java type checks each format specifier against the corresponding argument. Those are variable length argument. If the argument does not match, illegal format exception is thrown. Once you have formatted a string, you can obtain it by calling to string method. Continuing with the preceding example, the following statement obtains a formatted string content in format. Okay, string string format dot to string. If you simply want to display the formatted string, there is no reason to first assign it to string object. Okay, if you want to display only. When a formatted object is passed to print ln, for example, this two string method is automatically called. You don't have to call it. Like in the all type of Java normal program. Here is a short program. Put together all of the pieces showing how to create and display formatted string. Format demo. First of all, format an object is created. Java dot util package is uh, imported over here. Format dot format. Formatting percent %ez, percent %d, percent %f with java 1098.6 and printer and format you can obtain a reference to the underlying output buffer by calling the output method out method it returns a reference to an appendable object now that you know the general mechanism used to create a formatted string reminder of this section discuss in detail each conversion okay so basic is done now you will see now in detail and now in detail we will also describe various options such as justification, minimum, minimum field width and procedure. Okay. Formatting string and character. To format an individual character use percent %c. This causes the matching character argument to be output unmodified. Okay. So whatever character you are specifying as a variable length argument, it will be matching character argument unmodified to format a string use percent %s. Formatted numbers to format an integer in decimal format use percent %d. To format a floating point value in decimal format use percent %f. Same as a C, C programming language to format a floating point value in scientific notation, use percent %e. Numbers represented in scientific notation take this general form. X point D, 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 whatever numbers up to floating points are there, I mean integer, E is exponential plus or minus Y, Y. Okay. So, E plus 23 like this or E minus 10 or like this. Okay. The percent %g format specifier causes formatter to use as either percent %f or percent %e whichever is shorter. Okay. Whenever you are specifying the percent %g, it causes the formatter to use either percent %f or percent %e whichever is shorter display the output. Now we will see the example in detail. For doubles from 1000 less than 1.0 e plus 10 and i into 100 so i into equal to 100 means i is equal to i into 100 okay so formatted string using percent g we are displaying okay so whatever the shorter format is will be displayed thousand then uh, one lakh thousand one lakh this is e plus zero seven e plus 0, 09 and so on okay you can display integers in octal or hexadecimal format by using percent octet octal and percent x for hexadecimal hex percent x octal o 196 96 so octal format is c4 
सॉरी हेक्साडेसिमल फॉर्मेट इज सी फोर ऑक्टल इज थ्री जीरो फोर यू कैन डिस्प्ले फ्लोटिंग पॉइंट वैल्यू इन हेक्साडेसिमल फॉर्मेट बाय यूजिंग परसेंट ए द फॉर्मेट प्रोड्यूस बाय परसेंट ए एपियर्स अ बिट स्ट्रेंज एट फर्स्ट ग्लांस दिस इज बिकॉज इट्स रिप्रेजेंटेशन यूजेस अ फॉर्म सिमिलर टू साइंटिफिक नोटेशन दैट कंसिस्ट ऑफ अ सिग्निफिकेंट एंड एक्सपोनेंट बोथ इन हेक्साडेसिमल ओके परसेंट ए for hexadecimal output floating point values in hexadecimal format you can display using percent a but it can feel as strange at the first glance because its representation uses a form similar to scientific notation that consists of both significant and exponent and both in hexadecimal format the output if you are using the floating point to display in hexadecimal format floating point value in hexadecimal format using percent a and what is the output is 0x1 dot sig pex c contains the fractional portion portion of the significant and exp contains the exponent p indicates the start of the exponent okay So uh, format dot format percent a 123.123 will return this output 0x1 point ec 7dm 3b 645a 1d p6. Since we are using this percent a, this output is seeming strange at the first glance. Okay. So this way we have seen multiple topics related the related to more utility classes. in the next session we will see more interesting topic related to this prop, uh, chapter only okay so till then you can practice and enjoy the utility classes use the methods given in the table try to practice them at home and enjoy the utility program okay and try to implement them Uh, as far as possible to real world application generate any real world uh, generate any real world example or anything uh, generate any programming question that can have such a method in that so that you can also practice them and you can also understand the real use of this function okay so meet you in the next session with a new topic thank you so much